Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Frederick Winsness, and I'm with NetHope and the NetHope Solutions Center. Uh, today, uh, we are very pleased to uh, broach a very popular topic, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and particularly in the uh, health space. Uh, we have a uh, large group of experts with us today, and we're going to uh, hear uh, about this topic from multiple different uh, perspectives. Uh, before we get started, uh, I just want to go over some general housekeeping rules. We are going to be quite a large uh, crowd today, so uh, we do want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, please open up uh, the chat window uh, in WebEx. You do that by clicking the little bubble, uh, the third icon from the right under the, um, the slides and follow along there, post your questions in the chat window. You can post them uh, to all attendees or you can post them to me uh, privately and I'll rebroadcast them to, our, to everyone. But we will reserve some time towards the end of the hour today for uh, a facilitated Q&A session. And as always, we are um, recording this session today and uh, uh, after um, conclusion of the webinar, we will be posting the, both the recording and the slides to the NetApp Solutions Center, and I will be posting that link uh, to the chat window uh, in a little while. And at the very end, uh, when we close down the webinar, you will see a webinar satisfaction poll presented to you in your browser. If you could, could take a couple of minutes to answer those questions, that would be very helpful. It will help us improve this webinar series over time. So uh, with that, um, I want to pass it on, on to our moderator, uh, Sonia Rutzel. She's with Catholic Relief Services. So over to you, uh, Sonia. Thank you very much, Frederick. And thank you very much uh, to NetHope for hosting this webinar with us. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our um, webinar. As Frederick said, it's on artificial intelligence and machine learning in health programs. And we have a very diverse speaker panel for you. Um, we will ask each, each speaker a question, and they will um, answer this question um, in a bit more detail. And that gives you also time to think about questions for our um, uh, panel expertise. And then we have time for you all to um, uh, yeah, ask questions. And we have some um, general Q&A uh, lined up for the, the end of our webinar. So um, let me introduce you to our speaker panel. We have uh, Toby Norman, he's the CEO of Simprint Technology. We also have Dr. Anu Shankar, he's the research, a senior research scientist at the Harvard um, Chan School of Public Health. Uh, Stephen Helen, director of ICT4D and GIS at Catholic Relief Services. And Neil Sahota, um, he's the UN um, AI subject matter expert and also a faculty member at the University of California and an IBM master inventor. As you can see, a lot of expertise, so do bring your questions up in the chat window. And um, without further delay, I'd like to pass on to our first speaker, um, Toby will be sharing with us some uh, insights on what are the main opportunities and risks of deploying artificial intelligence in digital healthcare. We'll be over to you. Great. Thanks very much. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah, we can. Thank you. Great. So um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Toby Norman, co-founder and CEO of Simplint Technology. Uh, to start us off, I'm going to lay out some of the big picture opportunities and risks that we're seeing in the application of AI and machine learning models to digital healthcare challenges. Rather than just looking at a single application, I'm really going to try and focus today on sort of a couple of the big tensions we see in this space, specifically three tensions, learning versus bias, uh, data versus privacy, and customization versus vendor lock-in. To give very quick background context, the lens that we view this sector is through biometrics for patient identification and verification. So our team at Simprints is a nonprofit technology company from the University of Cambridge with really a mission to radically improve transparency and effectiveness in global health delivery using tools like AI, biometrics, GPS mapping. So in real terms, what that means, for example, we work with BRAC's frontline healthcare workers in Bangladesh to link mothers and children to the healthcare records through fingerprints. 
enabling continuity of care for patients as they move from health workers to facilities, but also enabling BRAC to track who they've reached and who they've missed. And I think one of the really fun parts about our job is working as a technology partner, we get a front row seat into many organizations and programs about how they're actually applying artificial intelligence versus potentially just writing about it. So if we could go to the next slide. I think one of the first challenges to pull out in the application of AI for digital healthcare uh, is the challenge between learning versus learning from our biases. And so for example, I'm sure as most people on the call are familiar, Really, the central attraction of AI for many organizations is the ability to have algorithms learn from data to make decisions. And the opportunity here is huge. You know, for example, we see teams like Google DeepMind release applications like Streams to monitor and predict when patients uh, with liver disease or kidney disease deteriorate and allow doctors and nurses to get to them in time uh, to prevent a patient crashing. Similarly, we have partners in the field who are using tools like Superset to do predictive analytics on uh, community health worker visits, essentially allowing them to use past performance in terms of visit coverage to predict which areas of health workers they'll reach in the future. And more closer to our field, we're using tools like image recognition and approaches like convolutional neural nets to do machine-driven biometric image recognition. The flip side uh, to this capacity of AI to learn is, of course, it is entirely determined by the type of data we train these models on, what these algorithms learn, and the risk is that they'll learn from our pre-existing biases. So for example, there was a study released by MIT early this year, um, run by Joy Willemwini, the researcher on the, the right-hand side of that photo, that showed, for example, that across some of the top machine learning algorithms put out by IBM, uh, put out by a number of Chinese companies, Microsoft and others, the, their face classification software was nearly 99% accurate with white males, but error rates ballooned up to over 35% with black females based on the quality of the data sets. Similarly, there was a review in Nature uh, released earlier this year, and I can share the link in the side panel, looking at both bias trends in terms of racism and sexism in machine learning algorithms. And to be clear, this isn't bias in the traditional sense, uh, these algorithms are not trying to be biased, but based on the quality of the data that we train them on, this can, and can introduce our own biases into machine learning. So sort of that old adage, garbage in, garbage out, holds very true for AI. And particularly as we think about applying it for digital healthcare applications, we need to think very hard about the balance of our data sets to make sure algorithms aren't learning from our biases. If you click to the next slide, one of the second, I think, real opportunities, but real risks with machine learning applied to digital healthcare, uh, is the balance between the incredible access to data that we have now versus the incredible breaches of privacy uh, that data potentially makes us susceptible to. For example, conceptually, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is a pretty old concept. Computer scientists have been theorizing about it for decades. However, for a long time, there have been very few real-world applications that have taken off. And I think as many of you probably know, two things have really driven what some call the end of the AI winter. First was the access to cloud computing, so sort of a cheap distributed processing power. And the second is the explosion of data that we've experienced um, really in the past decade. So for example, the IDC estimates now that globally, um, by the end of 2025, there's going to be 163 zettabytes, which is 10 times more data in the universe, uh, in our human universe that exists today. That's 10 to the power of 70 bytes. And if you look at all of human history, at the moment we have an explosion of data and access to data that we've never seen anything comparable to before. Now for digital healthcare applications, this is a huge opportunity. For example, when I started my doctoral research with frontline field workers, most of the work in Bangladesh was entirely paper records, which means by the time aggregate numbers reach the Ministry of Health or reach the headquarters, you've lost 99% of that data. You're only taking the very top level aggregate statistics from your community health workers or from your facilities. While that's exciting, it also exposes us to huge risks. You know, I think many people are probably aware there's been giant security breaches over the past couple of years. Uh, the U.S. government has seen major hacks. The Philippines government, closer to our sector, Red Rose, was attacked by a competitor. But it's not just security breaches. For example, the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook scandal wasn't a security breach. It was a privacy breach. 
And so as we think through some of the potential applications of AI, thinking through what are the privacy standards that we will apply is a really thorny challenge. Uh, for example, we typically stand behind GDPR, uh, the new European General Data Protection Regulation, as one of the stricter standards that teams can potentially follow. Uh, but it's definitely not perfect. There are limitations in this area. And figuring out how do you get genuinely informed consent, say from a, a frontline patient who might have five to seven years of education across their life, it's a really complex issue and something we can dig in a little further. Moving to the next slide. Finally, one of the tensions I think we want to pull out as we dive into specific examples um, of AI and machine learning is a huge opportunity with AI is the ability to customize algorithms to a degree that we've never been able to do before. And so today it is easier than it, it has ever been to actually build machine learning models yourself with very small technical teams. Large players like Google um, have opened up their models like TensorFlow and built a range of tools, uh, both for computer-based applications, but also through TensorFlow Lite um, phone-based applications. And on the hardware front, you know, the real trend now is towards edge or on-device machine learning, which means you're able to upload your custom data set to a cloud hosted by Google or one of the other large providers, and then push that onto frontline mobile devices, which for many working in digital healthcare and developing countries is really the key because that allows you to apply machine learning models offline, in real time, on device, without having to be connected to a cloud. One of the challenges that opens up, though, is that particularly in the digital healthcare space, interoperability and standards is a really thorny problem to begin with, much less before now we start having custom models um, with signatures and embeddings that are unique to certain projects that mean it's very difficult to transfer that data and use those models between projects. So to give a concrete example in the biometric world, you know, if one vendor comes in and stores a number of biometric images in their proprietary format, for projects, say doing um, confidential HIV testing and using the biometric as a unique way to link patients to record. If that can't be transferred to another vendor, that Ministry of Health or that hospital is potentially locked into that vendor going forward. And at the moment, there aren't standards that we've agreed internationally for the use of AI in this space. So if we go to the next slide, I think there's a number of really exciting, the conclusion really uh, is that for every complex problem, there is an answer that's clear, simple, and potentially wrong. I think AI has a huge number of potential applications and opportunities in this space. With it comes some tensions. I'd be careful of the cynics either too far on the left or the right to say that we shouldn't use it versus it's going to solve all our problems. The answer is probably somewhere in the middle. But as you think about the application of AI in your own problems, I would keep a close eye on these three tensions to figure out what's the best way forward to use this as a tool to solve challenges, but definitely not as a silver bullet. So let me pause there, but I'm happy to dig into any of these further during the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you very much, Toby. That was a great start. Um, and it's my pleasure now to introduce you to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Anu Shankar. He's the uh, Senior Research Scientist at Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And um, Anu, over to you. Great, thanks so much. Uh, great to be with everyone uh, today. I'm going to be presenting uh, some work uh, to you today related to the use of uh, AI machine learning uh, for frontline health workers. And a lot of the work is based on data collected through this platform. It's called the Open Smart Register Platform. Uh, this is a scalable uh, open source uh, platform that enables frontline workers to, digi to digi digitally uh, uh, register and track their clients. Um, and as you know, in, uh, currently, if most frontline workers uh, are using paper registers. Uh, transition to this type of platform really enables a lot of the AI and ML algorithms to be used uh, most effectively, uh, as uh, Toby was um, alluding to. And you can go to smartregister.org to really learn more uh, information about the platform itself. Uh, next slide. So some of the challenges, really, uh, for AI and machine learning, particularly in public health, I want to highlight a few of these. Uh, the first one is, of course, the use case itself, like what are you going to use AI and ML for, in fact? So really defining that well is important. Uh, many times you hear sort of general ideas that, gee, we want to use 
AI to improve health worker performance or to improve diagnostics, but you really have to formulate the question in a clear way. What particular type of diagnostic do you want to improve and uh, using what kind of information? And that brings me to the second issue, which is that you've got to decide what's the, uh, the type of data that you need to put into any sort of uh, uh, um, algorithm. It's not the case you can just uh, gather a, a whole lot of uh, information and assume the right information is going to be in there. And the key there really is identifying what is the right information that's likely to, in fact, uh, enhance the output of the algorithms um, themselves. And this br really brings me to the third point, which is the assumption that somehow AI or machine learning can clean up bad data or bad quality data. And that is not correct. Uh, if you have bad quality data, of course, the signal to noise ratio is not uh, going to be good and your uh, machine learning and AI algorithms are really not going to produce something uh, that's going to be useful, uh, going to be uh, very useful to you. Uh, then I want to highlight this issue related to the human gap, which is essentially uh, the willingness of frontline health workers and their supervisors and perhaps government or other officers or clinicians to trust the results that you're getting from these um, algorithms. So often um, these algorithms use some advanced statistical techniques, various types of uh, advanced analytical processes. And if these cannot be uh, explained carefully and, and so people understand what's going on and why that result is a reliable result, they may not be willing to accept recommendations from that and not trust the conclusions. And keep in mind a lot of the uh, recommendations uh, from AI, they are probabilistic sorts of recommendations. So yes, sometimes they're not going to be correct. So how do you work with that kind of information in the context uh, uh, of clinical care? And ultimately, I come down to this issue, which is humans help other human beings. Technology is just a tool, meaning that you're not going to get some great uh, change all of a sudden in your health program by using uh, AI. Ultimately, you really have to use this sort of fusion between high quality human resource implementation on the field linked with uh, the actual information itself. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through a use case here. Next slide. So basically, we were doing some work in Indonesia related to active screening for tuberculosis. And this involved uh, frontline health workers going to a health clinic and just asking other people, not just the patients, but other persons who were there at the clinic, um, if they had various uh, signs or symptoms of tuberculosis. And here I've listed uh, the symptoms there that these people were asked. And these people might be persons accompanying a patient, a relative, could be uh, a worker in the health clinic, uh, uh, actually. And just asking these questions and then deciding, are you a suspect TB patient and should you be referred to a more expensive uh, uh, assessment uh, like using uh, uh, a gene expert or a x-ray? And this work I'm going to really present to you now is done by uh, an analyst. His name is Ali uh, Septiandri. And um, I've listed there uh, the reference uh, at um, the bottom. So next slide. So we had this initial information of all this uh, uh, data from around uh, 4,000 persons or so, maybe close to 5,000 persons. So the first thing is actually going through the data preparation, cleaning, standardization. There's absent data, missing data. You have to decide, are you going to impute that and so forth? And I only emphasize this to understand that really there is quite a lot of data preparation that goes into any sort of machine learning uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, then you want to select potentially additional data that you might want to use that might be interesting. In this case, we selected clinic location. You can see there uh, in the table that for this particular analysis, using these three different uh, uh, ML approaches, XGBoost, uh, SVM, support vector machines, and just actually standard logistic regression, that when compared to the WHO scoring approach for those symptoms I showed you before, uh, the WHO scoring approach had an accuracy of around 30%, a sensitivity, which means the proportion of actual true TB cases detected was around 91%, and the specificity, which is uh, the false cases, uh, so the false positives you end up getting, uh, or, or uh, really is around 
uh, 20%. So it means that actually the WHO score um, uh, really doesn't correctly uh, identify persons who don't have uh, tuberculosis. And that has uh, implications for costs, of course. Using the AI approaches, what we, the main thing you can see is you're able to preserve the sensitivity uh, and the specificity goes up. Uh, so you can see you're talking about changes from, let's say, 20% specificity with the WHO algorithm up to around 40% uh, or more using these uh, different uh, ML uh, approaches. Next slide. So the implication of that is that, in fact, these frontline workers uh, equipped with this more advanced machine learning uh, algorithm can, in fact, increase their specificity by 20% or more. And this ends up, they save time and costs from doing unnecessary, more advanced uh, tuberculosis assessments because they have actually a, a better assessment of those patients who are more likely to actually be positive for tuberculosis. And I've shown you another display there on the bottom uh, of a data visualization and data reduction technique that's common now in machine learning and AI approaches. It's called uniform manifold approximation and projection. Uh, you can see on the left there, uh, each dot is a person, and I've encoded uh, each color there is a clinic. There's a basically around uh, 10 clinics there. And then on the right there, you can see that uh, all the yellow dots are the true TB cases. So you can see, in fact, there, just from the visualization itself, that um, many of these uh, uh, TB cases, true TB cases, are showing up uh, at specific clinics. So again, that just sort of confirms why, in fact, the specificity is increased by using uh, the other machine learning approaches. Uh, next slide. So I just want to uh, really finish with this slide uh, emphasizing that certainly AI and machine learning can have very important uh, 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 applications to increase workforce productivity, identifying false or bogus uh, data, for instance, is very useful. Uh, Peter Lubel Dowdy at Onus Systems is working on that quite extensively. Uh, you can think of ways to improve worker productivity. I showed you an example of that. Um, and also, of course, a lot of applications to in, improve uh, uh, client health itself by identifying specific client uh, health-seeking behavior, which clients are likely to come back, for example, for a health visit, which clients are likely to be compliant with their treatments uh, and so forth, and uh, what types of interact interactions or counseling sessions might be effective. So we really have to define what is uh, the use case. Um, so there's certainly a lot of potential, and I think we're going to be discussing more of those, hopefully, on the question uh, and answer. Uh, thanks so much. I think I'm going to end there. Uh, thank you very much, Anu, for sharing this interesting case study with us. Um, I would like to take this moment to uh, mention that we will share the um, slides afterwards um, with all the participants, so you don't have to um, be busy taking notes. Um, and we will also share the comments and a, a question uh, log afterwards as well. Um, so please do keep your questions and your comments coming. Um, and thank you also for posting resource links. I think that's very interesting and helps a, a more um, diverse overview. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce you to my colleague, Steve Helen, and Steve will be sharing some uh, use cases of AI machine learning in uh, the global programs at Catholic Relief Services. Um, Steve, over to you. In Malawi, we are using machine learning algorithms to predict food insecurity and by extension to influence uh, nutrition outcomes. So Malawi is a country where 84% of the people live in rural areas and rely on subsistence agriculture. And this, this characteristic makes the population particularly vulnerable to weather-related shocks. Uh, going back to 2015, there were devastating floods that displaced hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, since then, there have been severe uh, cyclical droughts and more recently, there is crop destruction due to the spread of the fall armyworm pest. Two years ago, we partnered with Cornell University to develop a low-burden, high-frequency data collection protocol 
across tens of thousands of households to track shocks, uh, household characteristics, things like demographics, assets, and location, and food security. And we measure that using what's called the Coping Strategy Index that looks at activities that households might be compelled into, such as skipping meals or sending their children out to beg. We apply two different uh, machine learning algorithms to predict this household level vulnerability. And we validate the models in the field. And ultimately, we're able to predict with high confidence the specific households that would be at risk of food shortages a full one to two months in advance. And this is an improvement and an extension to what's available through services like FuseNet, which are providing a prediction and monitoring around a famine at a broader geographic area. So it's kind of taking that as one of our inputs, but really detailing down to the specific household level where we'll see the vulnerability. This early warning information is now regularly shared with the local village development committees so that they can plan and target responses more effectively. Uh, since we've implemented this in Malawi, we're now in process of extending this to Madagascar. So we've been through the first few months of this high frequency data collection. Um, we've put in place a slightly different algorithm that's more contextually appropriate to that location and the specific needs there. Some of the challenges that we're, we're facing with this, I'd say kind of fall into two categories. Um, number one is that the technology still requires a high degree of customization to apply to each use case. This requires specialized skills. It doesn't replicate easily. And this manifests itself by, you know, I gave two examples, Malawi and Madagascar. We have a portfolio of about 500 projects. So we have these point examples of this being used effectively, but the technology is not yet easily replicable to use um, at scale as a normal part of our project operation. I believe that over time that will evolve. And I think one of our roles as the international development community is to influence uh, some of the technology partners to begin to make more of the AI tools um, more accessible to non-specialists and what I would call the democratization of AI tools. Uh, this, the second barrier that we're seeing is, I'd say within our organization, most of our staff don't know or are not aware of what's possible with artificial intelligence or simply how to get started. So we need to do a much better job at socializing what's possible, explaining what resources are available. And you know, if I can offer some commentary on how to get started as a uh, NGO uh, practitioner, um, first is to, to get a good expert. You know, at this point where the tools are not as easily accessible, um, we found that establishing a partnership, whether it's with a uh, specialized technology provider, a university, or simply bringing somebody on board that has the, this specific skill set can lead to some early successes. And then the, the second focus is to lay the groundwork to use AI as a strategic capability that achieves specific outcomes. At CRS, we're approaching this in several ways. Uh, number one, we a couple months ago formed a task force. So this is spearheaded by our monitoring and evaluation unit in partnership with our information technology group. That's, that will be doing things like creating guidance, uh, selecting tools, curating trainings, um, socializing the art of what's possible, and establishing uh, support models and partnerships. And if I can leave with kind of one closing comment, um, you know, at this point, we are still very much in a learning phase, um, striving not to overlook you know, biases, some of the concerns that, that Toby called out, and really keeping an eye on the fact to make sure that the results are impactful so that te technology itself does not become self-justifying. Excellent.
Well, thank you very much, Steve. Um, and that is, I think, a very good um, transition to um, our next speaker. Um, Neil, we'd like to ask you, what are the key questions you should ask yourself before starting an AI-based initiative? And also, um, what are the small things you can do to make a difference? Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Sonia, and uh, a good day or good evening to everyone wherever you are. Um, so just to, I guess, build off, I think, what, what Steve was saying, um, really to get started, it's not about coding. Um, a lot of people, that's their first reaction to doing something with AI or machine learning, that it's like 100% coding. And that's not the case. As you've actually heard from Toby and Anuj and Steve, data is really important. Having good, actually having the data and having good data is key, as well as having the subject matter experts to actually train your solution. But that being said, I walk it back to even an earlier standpoint that you have to really think about the problem that you want to solve. And I think that's where a lot of people struggle. They, they think that everything has to be so technically oriented. How am I going to be able to do everything? You need to find someone good. And I, I'll use law as an example because it's a very slow moving area and nothing's really broken and we're always slow to adopt things. But you hear a lot of the buzzword of legal tech. But if you look at all the companies doing legal tech, very few are successful. And, and more so because you have, yes, yeah, some really smart technologist guys trying to do something, but they understand the pain points of the industry. The, the actual the legal tech companies are actually the most successful, are actually ones that are started by lawyer, lawyers or paralegals. And they're not people that actually have like a strong technical background. They just know where the problems are to try and actually solve those. So I'm a firm believer that if you get a really smart group of technologists together, they're going to think of the cool ideas like the self-driving car. I'm not saying there's not value in something like that, but if you gave some physicians or nurses or clinical researchers some basic understanding of the technology and then put them in a room together, think about what they could actually do. So to really get started, you ask yourself, what is the problem that I want to solve? See, do you have the right subject matter experts to help you? Then identify those opportunities and then start looking at, okay, who should I partner up with, much like Steve was talking about, that can bring that technical expertise to help you build a solution. They can help me see, do I actually have the right data, the good data, can I manufacture the data, train a solution. Now, I know that people say that that sounds kind of easy. Um, it, it's not. AI is not like a magic solution that just happens to know stuff. Uh, the data is always a challenge, especially in healthcare, because a lot of people, unfortunately, they don't share information. So it's going to be very hard to access what you need. The second is how do you actually free up subject matter expert time? So I remember with IBM Watson when we were teaching it about cancer research and trying to help develop some new target proteins, one of the biggest challenges is actually training Watson to understand the space. And while we had access to the data, having access to some of our experts was more of a challenge because they're very busy people. They're working on real world problems, they're trying to help people. And so every hour you take away from them doing that to train is a challenge. And so takes it's a long process. That being said, there's real value in trying to do this type of work. Now, people always think kind of big bang, well, think pie in the sky, let's try and, you know, find a cure for cancer, let's try and put an end to, you know, sickle cell anemia. These, these are great ideas, but they're very large, very effort intensive, and could take years, potentially even decades. I, I think there's actually a lot of low hanging fruit out there that often gets overlooked that we could actually do with AI machine learning. And I actually heard a couple of good examples from the other panelists. Firm believer that small changes actually make a difference. So if this is kind of your first foray and 
trying to think about this technology, don't think big bang, think small, think incremental, right? There's a Spanish company called Ivy Health that they're very much about uh, preventive medicine and trying to focus on wellness. Uh, they could try and go and say, well, hey, can I create like a totally personalized routine around nutrition, physical fitness, mindfulness, all these things. It would take forever. Instead, they're looking at small incremental things and say, well, we have all these exercise videos, right? It's not, but to try to make a one size fit all, could I tailor that using AI where based on what I know about the person, about their current physical condition, their goals, you know, maybe some of the restrictions that maybe instead of them doing this exercise, you know, 12, you know, three sets, 12 reps each, maybe they can only start off by doing, you know, one set, three reps, but let them build up over time. So to really create that, you know, personalized trainer for you, but take it stepwise. And once you get that, then you go a little bit more, and then you go a little bit more. You'll find that over time, these small changes will really add up to make a difference. So the best advice I can give you is think about the problem you want to solve. Don't, don't worry too much about the technology range, but the problem you want to solve, the opportunity you have out of that, find a good partner, and then see do you have the data and the expertise to actually create a solution. And think small. Start small and build on it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Neil. That's very good advice. And also thank you to all the speakers to um, um, very much sticking to your um, time. So we have plenty of time for discussion now, which is fantastic because we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, we'll just go uh, a bit chronologically. So one of the first questions, um, and maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Toby first because you mentioned it in your presentation. Um, are you aware of any audit processes designed to prevent the ethical risk? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so to my knowledge, there are no comprehensive audits uh, to prevent all the ethical risks. So if you look in the common panel, I think Merrick's uh, Shades of USAID uh, document, there's a good section in there looking at the ethical risks. So if you're thinking about deploying an AI into one of your projects, I'd definitely take a look at that. Um, the frameworks are still quite nascent. I would still argue I think the strictest framework currently is Europe's GDPR standard, which many of us are probably familiar with now because it's hit you know, every email list and every uh, group that we're part of. But particularly some of the practices that they use, like data protection impact assessments, uh, I think is a really solid approach to try and think through preemptively some of the risks. I'll share a link. If anyone wants to see examples, we post the ones we do at Simprints publicly. Please feel free to sort of steal that format and steal that template. But what you're really looking to do here is just work through methodically and intelligently what are the genuine risks that having this type of data collection, which you'll need to train a model, and then the deployment of that AI model could potentially have. And talk with people both within your organization but really critically outside of your organization as well, both with experts, uh, which I'm sure you can get through communities like this, but also thinking through how it might be perceived at the field level, and that will hopefully give you the strongest possible audit in terms of potential risks on your project. Excellent. Thank you very much, Toby. Any of the other panelists like to uh, chip in on um, preventing the ethical risks? Yeah, this is one resource I would add, there was a body of work that came out um, just in, I think within the past year called the Toronto Declaration that really called out some good, good perspectives about how to prevent discrimination when machine learning or artificial intelligence is applied and thinking about things focused on uh, human rights and equality and offering some good guidance. And I think that that provides um, at least the a foundation upon which maybe more deliberate methods to audit or review or certify algorithms could be based upon. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, we will share the link uh, as well in our uh, summary. Um, 
my next question, um, maybe I can address it to Anu. Um, what are the what are some of the most promising data sources for AI and uh, machine learning in the health space? And what challenges do you see in assessing or sharing such data? I think some of that second part we might have already answered, but please. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. And I, I would say um, a huge part of the answer as well, you know, it depends on what you want to do uh, with the um, data. Um, there are several databases uh, in public health that, uh, that are really open uh, for uh, people to look at. Uh, a lot of those databases relate to household survey data. So for instance, the demographic and health survey uh, data, uh, the UNICEF uh, multiple indicator cluster surveys, um, these you can, you can access if you're looking uh, to look at, uh, use machine learning to identify sort of general uh, predictors of disease patterns uh, in communities and in uh, individuals and households. Um, there's also um, uh, data that would be available. Uh, there's some uh, biological health um, uh, data warehouses. Uh, PhysioNet is uh, one example of, of that. And um, there are also uh, ways to access data from social media. Uh, from Twitter and so forth, some of these platforms actually uh, will allow you to access uh, a certain percent uh, uh, um, of the tweets uh, and so forth. Other than that, uh, certainly there are many other sources um, that uh, certain consortia uh, are collecting. For instance, there are some groups that are uh, using uh, personal health uh, uh, personal health information trackers like uh, the Fitbits uh, or Actigraphs, and um, I think getting in touch with some of those groups and creating some uh, collaborations would enable you to access more of that sort of uh, uh, information also. Um, and also, one thing that's really growing very quickly in terms of information sources are um, uh, 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 with the deployment of universal health care, national health insurance systems as, a, as a, 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 a big source of data. Again, there's lots of security, health, the, um, confidentiality issues there, but if you can develop a collaboration uh, with uh, a government, that would be uh, a source of a lot of um, uh, information. And certainly some of the work uh, done with OpenSRP or OpenMRS uh, with collaborators uh, in country, if you're able to create links uh, with that, those would be some other large scale sources of uh, information. But I, I, I think the, the open ones that I mentioned earlier would, would be uh, the easiest ones to get uh, started with. Excellent, thank you very much for that advice. Uh, next question is from Frederick, please go ahead. So yeah, there's been a lot of talk about you know uh, being responsible with the data and uh, the risks involved and everything. But did you can you point to some resources that are available to educate staff uh, on how to uh, handle data responsibly? I guess yeah, anyone I, can jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, one thing I would do, this is Anurag Shankar, I would definitely recommend um, there are several uh, uh, exams on the web that uh, people can take related to um, uh, confidential and ethical use of data. And um, I can, uh, I'll send through some of the uh, links for those. I don't have those handy now, but I think uh, having your staff go and read that information and uh, to take those online exams is extremely useful. There's also quite a lot of training, I think, in education that needs to be due, uh, needs to be done with um, uh, frontline health workers and government staff. So the actual confidentiality, in fact, of uh, paper-based information is not as high as one might expect. And I think one of the nice things about this information becoming electronic is that it's really raising these issues around uh, confidentiality and ethical treatment 
uh, of persons and their information because the ability to share it so easily has really prompted people to examine that. But in fact, um, data confidentiality in many frontline health systems, even on the paper-based systems, has not been what it should be. So uh, developing uh, training overall not only with your staff, but also with any persons that they're engaged and uh, in, engage with, I think would would be extremely useful. And uh, there are some resources for that um, as well in some of the, the the links for the online trainings. There's uh, uh, lots uh, of resource materials you can download. Johns Hopkins University has a um, a lot of resource materials related to. Uh, 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 research in human populations uh, as part of the uh, uh, part of the training. So I think what uh, I'll put some of these links in. Um, I think with with the slides that are going to be available uh, from this. That'd be very helpful, Sonia. Back to you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, any of the other panelists like to chip in on uh, how to train your partners or colleagues on responsible data handling? Just a quick comment, so Toby Norman speaking. I th would maybe split these into two considerations. So I think there's data security, and in terms of how you manage you're keeping the data that you're collecting secure, uh, and you probably want to think about that in the different levels of your organization. So for example, for your moderators, for your technology or IT team, there are data security courses. I think Coursera and Udemy have a whole bunch. If you can afford it, there's sort of uh, external consultancies who will come in and run things like penetration testing to make sure the, sort of the system is secure, mm -hmm. and also do general staff education. And that's quite critical because really from a security point, the vast majority of data breaches are actually human error. Uh, more anything than not, it's people responding to spear phishing attempts or phishing attempts, giving away passwords and things voluntarily. Um, sometimes it's a technical security breach, but a lot of the time it's still that. Um, for the field level staff, there are things you can enforce. For example, if the frontline uh, workers are using mobile devices, there are things that you can employ like two-factor authentication, which would be considered best standard. The one caveat I would add to that is often you're going to be potentially working in low internet or connectivity settings, which can make some of those things more difficult to do, and making sure that the level of sort of security training you do is appropriate to the field level. The second area I think is equally difficult to challenge, which is around sort of privacy. So it's thinking through very carefully which data do we collect in the first place, and how do we you know, actually train users to get genuine and informed consent for doing that. And there's a really natural tension between, I think, the researcher. I come from a research background, and many of us want to collect all the data all the time immediately, versus actually the principle of data minimization, which is to collect as little data as possible to begin with, because that's the most safe and the most secure and the most privacy respecting route. And again, there are external consultancies who can come and train. There's a couple of web courses. We'll put up a couple of links. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, but usually this is something that I, I very rarely see rolled out perfectly immediately, something you want to iterate on and make sure you have the appropriate level of training for the appropriate level of staff. Thank you very much. Um, my next question is, or actually the next question, not mine personally, is for Neil. Um, more often than not, investment in the capacity of users is not prioritized in AI or machine learning initiatives. Um, so where can AI be most impactful and how would you advise to go about ensuring sustainability and in-country ownership um, of AI initiatives? That's a great question. And that's uh, it's a, it's a difficult challenge. I mean, the digital age, there really aren't many boundaries anymore. And I think it winds up boiling down to having a common set of best, practica, uh, best practices and ethical standards. Uh, one of the big challenges that I see, and I know a lot of people tend to talk about, is how do we handle things like with the infrastructure that exists or the resources or there's a talent gap in actually trying to do some of these things. And it's, it's just not an easy solution. It, it requires commitment, investment, and help. Um, I can point to the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, actually a U.S. territory. Um, they were very 
focused on the garment industry until the WTO relaxed the regulations uh, about 10 years ago, and suddenly other areas of oil became much cheaper, and their economy fell apart. They don't have the infrastructure to have massive tourism. So the question becomes, what could they do? And one of the things they were looking at, well, could we learn a little bit of technology and try and become a tech hub, right? Uh, people in Japan, South Korea, China are very familiar with that area, vacation in those spots. But the, the thinking was, could we, should we learn like basic skills like web and that kind of stuff? And the, the truth is, we actually have a unique opportunity to leapfrog and actually go into the AI and the blockchain and the IoT and try and become a, a tech hub. But one, they don't have obviously the the skills in house. So could they set up programs, education? They're actually actively working to try and do that, and actually partnering with some organizations around the world, including the Bay Area, for upskilling, internships, and stuff. There's also the question of internet speed and telecom. But there's enough traction in some of the first steps that they're doing that uh, South Korea Telecom has actually now said they're gonna bring 5G to the islands. So, so what they're really doing is what I like to call ecosystem models. They're looking to say, how can we build our own ecosystem and find the right partners? And I think to try and tackle some of these issues, keep things in country, in house, or sustainable at least, we start thinking in terms of ecosystems. Can't do everything ourselves. There's too many moving pieces. I'm a big believer about not reinventing the wheel. We have to think about what is it, what's the outcomes we're looking for, and what are the components that are going to drive that. And then, more importantly, who are the strategic partners we can actually work with to do something. And I think, particularly in healthcare, when we look at some of these things. We may not have all the pieces, but maybe we can find the partner that has the data. We can find those partners have the technical skills that we can actually look in different areas to actually say, what can we piece together? And for like the low middle income countries, this is actually a good opportunity for them to solve some pressing problems by building their own ecosystems. They may not have all the resources today, but there are now opportunities to form those partnerships to bridge those gaps. Oh, wonderful, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, the next question is for Anu. It's, I think it's more about a question around definition. In some of the examples shared, what's the real difference between artificial intelligence and old school statistical methods? Would you be able to comment on this? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a very good, good yeah, very good question. Um, so the, um, there's sort of two things there. Um, the one is that the 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 old school statistical approaches typically ask you to uh, to formulate in greater detail what are the uh, the variables or the predictors or the, the things that you think are going to be associated with a particular outcome, you know, uh, survival or being positive for some infection or whatever it is. Um, and um, so they're more uh, geared uh, to be hypothesis driven. So a lot of the regression analyses, for, for example, uh, uh, are like that. Um, and also the, um, uh, the the most of them are most of these statistical methodology the old school ones are either um, uh, based on simple classification system approaches or uh, uh, a regression approach uh, of some sort. The uh, AI approaches tend to be uh, um, a bit more complex and being able to look at more advanced um, uh, uh, probabilistic uh, decision-making and approximation approaches. And typically, you're not being asked there to um, uh, define as well a, uh, a priori, a particular uh, hypothesis, but instead looking for patterns in the data that might be associated um, with some particular outcome or even looking at natural clusters uh, in the data itself. Now, having said that, I will say that um, there's not often that much, you don't always get that much of a improvement 
in insight using some of the more advanced AI approaches compared to some of the old school approaches. So I always recommend, in fact, get your data together if you want to do data mining, whatever it is. Start with some of the simple approaches, whether they're uh, the machine learning or the old school ones. Start with those first, and then you can move on to the more advanced uh, approaches. But uh, that's a, a very good question. Thank you very much. And our last question I'd like to address to Steve. Um, can you please expand on guidance how to engage Iranian staff who are interested in using AI and uh, machine learning? So I would say definitely engage and not bring in. Um, you know, I really believe that what we're seeing in these early days with AI and machine learning is quite analogous to what we saw 15 years ago with the start of the mobile revolution, that this technology paradigm will be transformative to our work in the aid and development sector, and trying to rein it in, I think, is, is the wrong approach, but rather to engage. And one, one example I can share that we, we kicked off about a year ago was developing a some guidance to use within our organization that really tried to surface three things. One was to explain uh, through some examples the art of what's possible applying these techniques into the sectors that we work in. The second objective was to enumerate some of the resources that are available, so areas of expertise, tool sets, and so forth. And the third is to start to um, develop some thinking around uh, biases and areas to be cautious of. And we, you know, this was packaged in the form of, you know, like a two-page document and circulated um, broadly within our organization. So all of our field practitioners, all of our program managers, technologists, m and &E staff, and others had a chance to see that. And that's something that I, th I think is a way to um, start to open that conversation about this technology trend, which I think will really continue to grow in, in importance and in impact in the work that we're all focused on. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we're now nearly at the end of our webinar, so I would like to thank all our panelists for their fantastic contribution. And I have a final uh, question um, for each of you. So I would like to ask um, first Toby and then Neil, what is your key trend you're seeing in use of AI for health programs? Toby, would you mind answering this? Sure. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yes. <laughs> sorry. Um, so I think the key trend that I'm seeing is really use of AI um, to figure out where health visits are happening and where they're going to be happening. I think that's really exciting, but we've got to think through the tensions we talked about. You know, do we have biases in the data in terms of what we're expecting uh, to see? Are we just having our highest performers generate the most data and thus the models are biased towards those? I think we've got to think through you know, security and privacy very, very carefully. And then finally, long term, but particularly because this is, you know, it's a new field, it's a sexy field, a lot of funding is gravitating to this field. I think we're not engaging enough with questions about future systems interoperability, which is we think about these tools not just deployed in pilots, but potentially at large scales, potentially with national government initiatives, we're going to have to confront these questions. So that's the trend, and those are the three things I would think through. Um, before engaging significantly with AI-based projects. Thank you, Toby. And Neil, do you have any final um, trend you'd like to share with us? I, I, I do. There's just two things that I'm seeing out in the field. So one is there's a big push towards personalized medicine. That's, you know, e even with the pools that we're using today, they're still a little too abstracted. And so there's more focus on using AI tools to help drive that to a much lower level, even to the level now where we're using some AI tools for genomic sequencing to figure out, you know, if there's four pharmaceuticals that might work for their diagnosis, which one would might be the best at what dosage based on your genetics. The second trend that I'm seeing is a focus on trying to actually 
create and use AI tooling to try and solve more of the common problems or at least assist and reduce the time on those common problems to free up doctors, nurses, and researchers to work on the more complex cases, maybe the more, you know, infrequent or rare cases that have a much more like fatal or long-term damage to people. So essentially freed up more time to do that type of work. Wonderful, thank you. Um, that pretty much concludes our webinar. Thank you very much to our speakers and also uh, to NetHope for facilitating this webinar for us. Um, we just have one more announcement. Um, I'd like to highlight that we currently have an open call for speakers for our uh, next ICT4D conference which will take place in Kampala on April 30th till May 3rd. And the call for speaker ends uh, end of this month, and particular AI machine learning, again, will be very important topics we like to discuss. So please do um, consider applying as a speaker. And uh, then we will um, meet here uh, for our next ICT4D webinar again, uh, December the 12th, when we will be talking about digital financial tools for humanitarian response. Until then, I thank you very much for joining and I'm looking forward to reconnect next month. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Sonia and everybody, all the presenters and uh, ask everyone to please uh, answer the short webinar satisfaction poll that you'll see in your, uh, on your screen as you exit the, uh, the uh, webinar today. Thanks, everyone, and we'll be back in touch soon. Take care. Have a great rest of your day. So, bye-bye.